This is Jeff Stansberry from University of Colorado, and I'd like to describe uh, some of the chemistry-related aspects to the photopolymerization of dental composite materials. To provide a little context, the composites as initially introduced were two-part redox polymerized materials. Back in the 1950s, 1960s, when UV photocuring was first developed, it was fairly quickly adopted into dentistry because it eliminated some of the problems associated with mixing, predominantly things like getting uh, a porosity uh, incorporated into the materials. It also provided for a, uh, an extended working time that was very well received in dentistry. The in UV lamps were not particularly powerful, and that was partly because there were concerns about the UV exposure to more powerful lights, and a consequence of that was that depth of cure was an issue. So shortly after visible light initiated polymerizations were developed, they too were adopted into dentistry and very quickly became the, the industry standard for the polymerization of uh, dental materials. Looking at the energy associated with photons at different wavelength ranges, we can see an advantage for UV polymerization in that a photon in that wavelength range is sufficient in terms of energy to directly cleave a carbon-carbon double bond and generate free radicals. Whereas the visible light range of four to 500 nanometers, those are less energetic photons, not capable of direct cleavage. And so these rely on two component initiator systems. They're all part of one, a one component composite package, but there are two different components to the initiator system within that typically camphorquinone and then amine. And this allows the activated state of the camphorquinone to interact with the amine. And what ends up happening is a cleavage of the carbon-hydrogen bond within the amine to give the uh, initiating radical. So these longer wavelengths have some uh, some benefit over UV and that they have greater penetration potential, meaning greater depth of cure potential. Talking about the advantages of, of uh, photopolymerization, they're able to work under ambient conditions, obviously important to dentistry, accommodate a wide range of monomer types and, and polymerization mechanisms. Dentistry makes a lot of use of the temporal control that's offered by photopolymerization, not so much of the spatial control. And uh, the fact that we can cure fast or slow just based on whether we uh, use high or low uh, light intensity is an attribute. On the limiting side, we have to acknowledge that ambient lighting in the operatory, uh, through windows, all of these things are uh, concerns related to the stability of the material prior to use. Light has to be able to reach all parts of the of the uh, the part and uh, there's a significant degree of attenuation in in composite material, so that is a concern. And then some of these other factors are just uh, concerns that come along with uh, the use of, of polymerization processes in general. But photopolymerization is a tremendously enabling technology, and dentistry has made use of it. In composite polymerizations, terms of the uh, composite materials. As we add the filler, we are reducing the volume fraction of the resin. In doing that, we reduce the exothermic potential of the material. The introduction of filler also affects how light is transmitted through the material. Uh, there's reflection, scattering, absorption, and all this leads to attenuation. It also extends the path length and the Filler absorbs light and can become a, uh, a basically a heat sink. The effective cure temperature, meaning the combination of the ambient temperature and any exotherm associated with the polymerization or any uh, irradiative heating due to the curing light, dictates the final conversion can be achieved along with the, the rate of reaction affecting conversion. Polymer properties, and I'll, I'll highlight refractive index here, uh, change considerably as a change from a liquid monomer to a glassy solid polymer. 
And obviously, a change in refractive index in a material that's being photopolymerized can affect the photopolymerization. To give just a, uh, a few examples of effects of monomer chemistry on the photopolymerization process, here we have the rate of polymerization as a function of the degree of conversion. So this is a little more elaborate than a, uh, a, a standard conversion as a function of time, but that's the data we use to get this. And what this is showing, the blue line at the bottom is a homopolymerization of bisGMA. The black line a little above that is the polymerization, homopolymerization of triethylene glycol dimethacrylate, a low viscosity monomer compared to the high viscosity bisGMA. When we mix those two monomers together in various proportions, you can see we get a synergistic effect in terms of the rate of polymerization that can be achieved quite dramatically, but also in the final conversion that can be achieved. So we can get higher degrees of conversion out of the co-monomer system compared to either of the, uh, the individual monomers. Part of the reason for that is the viscosity effect. And here you see on a log scale the resin viscosity of a bisGMA TEGDMA series of resins uh, on the top line of the plot. The center line is a urethane dimethacrylate TEGDMA mix. And uh, if we take this a step further, we can then look at polymerizing each of these different compositions. And we'll see here, again, a difference, inherent difference in the maximum reaction rate potential for a given monomer. But we also see that there is a, uh, an agreement here in terms of the, an optimum viscosity that gives the highest rate of polymerization within any of these systems. So I'll let that be the short introduction to the, the chemistry of photopolymerization. And just move along to say thank you, and I hope this was uh, of some value to you.